Thanks, Tiffany. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, there's one, answer, one unanswered question. Um, so you managed to fox Richard, so well done, everyone. Uh, and that is, are Yara rules included? Um, I presume this means on the Sentinel side when you're writing hunting scripts or hunting queries. Um, <clears throat> it's probably not a question for, for today in, in many respects. Um, there are converters on the, on the web. I can't remember the name of the address, actually, of the, of the main one, uh, where you can type in your Yara query and it will convert it into KQL, which is what we use on, on log analytics, the underlying a database, both for IoT, actually, and, and for Sentinel. Um, but if you're stuck, if you do like to use Yara, I believe you can use Azure notebooks, which are a form of Jupyter notebooks, actually. And we do have our own uh, um, rather wonderfully called Mystic team internally. Uh, who write some of those uh, Jupyter notebooks and do some of the integrations. And I know they've worked with some of the Yara rule sets as well. So there is a small repository of them on GitHub as well, uh, which is where we uh, uh, share some of that particular stuff. So Mystic is Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center. And they managed to get a cool acronym out of it. Uh, and so I know they've done some work of, uh, uh, with Yara and, uh, and effectively Jupyter notebooks. So hopefully that'll point you in at least the right direction. Um, if I've misunderstood, then um, please type in, in the question again, uh, and Richard and I can have another go. Um, just to finish off the previous session, very, very briefly, is there is an alerts pane here as well, I forgot to mention. Uh, and so one, I think one of the questions we had just before the break was if you've got thousands and thousands, how do you actually start looking through? And so you've got a million of these alerts coming in. So this is all based off uh, Log Analytics database as well. So from here, that's pretty much all you can see actually for the moment at least. It's not that interesting. It's all quite new early days for this. You can see the meter attack tactics uh, if that happens to coincide. And then you can start obviously uh, filtering by severity or by name or whatever else you, you happen to choose on. Um, we can ignore this. I've, there it is. Very nice. Now ignore it. Because we're going to take exactly the same information and do something a little bit more interesting with it. So this is Sentinel. Uh, if, you're, if you're not aware of, of what Sentinel is, um, not too different from the previous screen in many ways. It's a view on a, in this case, very large log analytics uh, database. The difference with Sentinel is it has some intelligence to run across all those events or all, all those security alerts, uh, including some machine learning intelligence, so some learned intelligence, as it were, uh, to start picking out, you know, it can recognize patterns of attack, for example. So if someone's trying to brute force someone's password, for example, and then goes to a dodgy website, downloads Mimikatz and starts wandering around people's networks and then starts leaking files or whatever, that's the sort of thing you can actually pick up on as a pattern rather than an individual set of events. And the more you feed into Sentinel, of course, uh, the more uh, information it has to sift through to find those interesting uh, uh, occasions or events as they occur. And you do that by uh, going, through, going through something called data connectors. Um, so as you can see, we've got quite a few. There's 116 that come out the uh, uh, with the product. A lot of them uh, where you'll see preview everywhere in Sentinel and Defender for IT for that matter. Um, it's pretty worth noting at this point, the preview doesn't mean what it used to. Uh, so in the old hey, days... Paul, yep. can I interrupt you for a minute? Yeah, sure. We're not seeing your deck. Oh. That's a good point. Thank you. There we are. Oh, in that case, you didn't see the alerts earlier. Hold on. Oh, that was the right one. So this is alerts, sorry. I thought you could all see earlier. Uh, and then ignore them, because we're going to look at them somewhere else, which is in Sentinel. Uh, so this is Sentinel overview, which looks a bit more interesting if you can actually see the screen. And then if you go into data connectors, this is where we're finding out what can you easily connect into Sentinel. And we say easily because if your connector's not here, you can build your own or you can find out some other way of getting information in. There's always a way to get information into Sentinel. Now, we don't have to go down too far, of course, to find Azure Defender for IoT. But actually, there's some key ones in here for Azure Active Directory, for example. It's not enabled in this particular tenant because we're just using this to play with IoT. But that's a key source of uh, security information. Who's been logging in, including in Defender for IoT, for example. And firewall manufacturers, proxy manufacturers, well, anything you can think of pretty much, including most of the Microsoft services, will all get piped into this particular one. So go right back up. Uh, where were we? Azure Defender for, there he is. Open up the page on here. 
Now we can see where we played in some packets, of course, from the other day. So you get a load of uh, uh, alerts. Obviously, got piped into this particular tenant, uh, as it was yesterday, actually, in this fact. And of course, if you've got multiple subscriptions, as we were saying earlier, you can have multiple subscriptions inside a tenancy, then you connect as many as you like into this particular uh, Sentinel instance. I remember from our earlier diagram or that little worked slide we went through in some depth, then Sentinel was going to be running on your customer's environment. That's quite nice in many other respects as well, because it means they pay for it, although it's very cheap for if you're just doing it for this. Um, but also means when you want to connect in your Defender for IoT stream, it's as simple, assuming you've got the right permissions, it's as simple as hitting connect and then save, and that's it. So that's all of the massive scene configuration you have to do. And if you've got all the other sources you might be interested in, then it's the same thing again. MDE, or in fact, Microsoft Defender 365, you can come in here and hit a big activate button and it does it all for you. As your active directory, same thing. So all incredibly simple. And then this bit's, remember this is in preview, so we're, we're hoping this will get fleshed out a little bit. So we have something called workbooks, which are dashboards, and we'll show those a little bit later. So somebody asked, I think, how do we actually start to um, get a view on lots of devices if there's too many to sift through manually? And then as somebody else mentioned, especially if the color schemes aren't particularly fantastic either. So we will show something uh, a little bit later. Here's a couple of KQL commands. You can start thinking around, around how to get some of the data out if you want to go in there and do some manual uh, query searching. Uh, and you can get an idea of what table then uh, Defender for IoT actually feeds its alerts into. It's one called security alert. Um, and then we've come with a rule as well, or a template for an analytic rule. So from here, you can create the rule as well. That's why I won't bother doing it because I don't think I've got right permissions in this particular one. But it can go in then, and therefore every time that, well, let's see if we can create it without curiosity. Ah, may not let us finish, but at least it gets into this bit. So we're filtering on the, obviously the alerts coming from Defender for IoT. You can filter by severity if you want to, and then you can obviously include specific alerts. So if we're after that Siemens F7 stop command, or we're after whatever it might be, that Rockwell one we're looking at, PLC one as well, and we can add that in as a specific alert we're actually looking for. So when Sentinel comes across this, and of course you can do other things with this as well, you can massively ramp all these up, you can join alerts together and all sorts of stuff. So it could be when Fred hasn't logged in properly 10 times and you get an alert through here and create an incident, for example, that type of uh, area. But we can do, once it's detected something has actually occurred that we're actually interested in, then we can go down to the automated response. And uh, under the covers, if any of you are uh, Azure um, fanatics, then you're aware that the actual automation engine that sits underneath a lot of the uh, automation products we have is something called Logic Apps, Azure Logic Apps. And Sentinel was based on exactly the same engine as well. Basically, if there's an API available on the platform you're trying to automate, then Sentinel will automate to it through Logic Apps. So you go through another screen, you create your uh, automation sequence, uh, give it a name when you save it, and then that's where you come in here and add that automation sequence in for when it detects that particular alert type coming through. So we won't create a rule, but that gives you an idea. Um, and that then builds up. So if you want to go into ServiceNow, which is a dead easy one actually, there's a catalog in Logic Apps as well of what you can connect to out the box. Although to be fair, a lot of people just go in and write their own ones through the API because it's not particularly difficult to actually uh, get involved. Uh, and that then allows you, if you see an alert, maybe on one that, what, what example did we use? The robot arm on the car production floor, then you can send an alert into ServiceNow that produces a ticket that goes off to the supervisor for that particular assembly line, because they need to go and do something maybe to that particular robot or the sensor on that robot, uh, whatever it might be, uh, to make sure it's running correctly and in a secured manner, of course. So all that eminently possible. Automation is a huge strength in Sentinel. Um, so if you, if you, again, if you've got any platform with an API that you can write to using generally you know, web-based uh, protocols, then you can automate the sequence of events that happens next. Um, and it, we, we scared a few people, I think Richard and I, a couple of months ago when we first, first started talking about automation, is that we're going to go in and start automating your devices and your IoT devices. Of course we're not. Uh, so we, we're well aware that those things don't run anything that we can ever change. Although for the future, that may change. Um, so there was a question in, I think, during the break around Refirm, uh, one of our more recent acquisitions. And so it doesn't take a genius to work out that it's going to become part of the IoT 
uh, overall product. So when we start producing our own IoT devices, we may have an ability to re, you know, remotely re, uh, rewrite the firmware or update firmware in a secure manner for those devices that happen to be running our build of an IoT device, for example. And again, you could automate that through Sentinel as well, for example, in, in that possible future state, just to give us some ideas around just how powerful this could be for the future. But to my back, if we come back to here, um, where are we data connectors? So there's hundreds in here. Uh, once they're all up and running, of course, you then start to produce incidents. Um, now what we do is, now I think we'll try and find that same one we saw earlier. Um, I can remember the actual number. Ah, let's see. Unauthorized internet connectivity. So uh, that won't be very well, one I've been talking about quite a bit. So we're going to view full details. Now we get to see what's actually been happening. Why is this? Obviously, you get to see some of the entities involved, what's actually been happening as well, including that meter attack technique as well. Um, so me to do a whole family now of attack techniques for uh, the IoT world, as well as what it's, you know, where it came from, of course, in the IT world as well. And I'm not sure we're going to get much on the alert. Well, there's the actual raw alert as it came in, and we may have a look at we'll have a look at that uh, later actually. Unless it allow, no, it doesn't. Uh, I thought we could look at the raw code there, but it doesn't actually let you just do that just from that particular screen. Um, so we get an idea of what's going on, some of the IP ranges involved, and then we can start looking at a more graphical view as well. So, right, okay, this isn't going to work particularly well on the screen because I've got it set at quite low resolution. Let's just get rid of that for the moment and zoom in a bit. As we can see, unauthorized internet access is down here, and then we've got some devices up here that have uh, been involved in that particular alert type. So let's try, well, let's have a look. What have we got? 109 as the device. Let's see the sensor itself. Let's have a look at this and see our related alerts. And now we start seeing what else might have been happening. So we can see some port scans, some mod bus exceptions, some other unauthorized types of activity. And it looks like it's been going on as well. And you can click on the idea being you can click on these and start to expand them out. If you can right click and see all your nodes, and it will then do the query for you, actually, if you wish to, to have a look through into Sentinel as well. Let's go back to here again. And then again, you get the timeline view. Um, so you get a quite a few insights into when you want to track down these problems. And of course, the joy of this is we're not just looking at Defender for IoT. If there's other uh, security data that is relevant to this alert, Perhaps there was a some team viewer packets that have been coming in as well. Or there's been an unauthorized attempt, login attempt on the team viewer server, perhaps, or something of that description, or even the firewalls managed to log something unusual as well. All that threat data can be funneled into Sentinel. And then you can start sifting through it, or allow, of course, Sentinel to sift through on your behalf and try and prioritize it for you so when you come in and monitor this. And again, because it's Sentinel, um, and this is the reason why we like it mainly, actually, is you can run Sentinel on your partner back at your SOC inside your partner environment, and then you can reach out into multiple customers. You can run a single query and drag back all that information back into your environment so you can start managing and monitoring customers, multiple customers, all at one time, one at one go. So that's all very nice. So let's get back. And then I think the last thing we're going to do, oh, we've got plenty of time as well. Good. Uh, let's have a look at some of the workbooks. Now, it may not be populated particularly well. Um, <clears throat> let's just expand that. So when we're saying oh, no, you can start describing some of this data as well, you can build your own dashboards for reporting. So these are obviously the different alert types we've been viewing. Uh, well, alert severities, which devices that you can do things like top 10 um, suspicious devices and all that type of thing. You can start building up in here. All these elements are these little panes as it were inside this dashboard are simple KQL queries. 
So you get this out the box, as it were, and then you can go in here and start editing this and put your other update for your own benefit. Or you can create one from scratch if you wish to as well. And these are the sets of KQL commands. So you get a graphical view into this data. Uh, and when we say this data, what do we actually mean? So we come back up to the actual underlying log analytics. And if you recall from earlier, we said that uh, Defender stores in security alert. So if we uh, let's have a look. And then let's do, let's just do a limit and see if we can actually find any ones if we're lucky. Right, here we are. That's, that's a nice SS7 stop command. So this is what a raw file, a raw alert actually contains to give you some ideas of what's actually inside this. Um, can we actually squish this up a little bit? There we are. Uh, so tenant ID, very boring, of course. Um, we do get UTC time, what's actually come through. Uh, lots of other reference information. You can start obviously correlating with other data that may be coming in as well. And then you get down to some more text based. So you can expand these out and you start to see this alert represents a deviation from alert network policy. Extended properties then come in, of course. And you can see it's a restart start command. It's on a particular sensor with a particular IP address. Uh, and you go on and on. So this, when we say an alert, it's quite a rich alert with the information you can actually get. And remember, all these alerts are free to ingest into Sentinel as well. So we're not creating a huge revenue for the customer in this, um, in this approach. It's more the ability to remotely monitor lots of different customers in one go. So lots of quite deep information you can get from here. So therefore, you can start building out your own uh, query strings, which may be a particular relevant to your customer types that you're particular monitoring and that then starts adding value from you know what you supply or what you add value from a managed service perspective it's because you're writing some of these particular uh, detection uh, queries as it were which are particular for their environment and the risks that their environment may actually have so there's lots of ability then to hunt around and then i mentioned notebooks earlier these are these jupyter notebooks over here um now there's a few demo ones in here i'm by no means i mean often these things are written in python from my from what i understand uh, not my area of expertise at all but i do know you can get ciara rules plugged into here as well if you want to start querying uh, all this data uh, using yara and then we do have some user entity behavior analytics i know easy for me to say um but if you start wanting if some of your devices are on an ip address at least you can, or it's not enabled in this particular one, uh, then you can start building up a top 10 list of IP, um, IPs across your entire network, which happens to include endpoints and of course now IoT devices as well as some sort of top points for looking into uh, to guide some of that guided hunting as it were to figure out what's actually going on. So there's loads of stuff, of course, you can do in Sentinel. The important bit is to go very way uh, far back to almost when we started talking around that slide around using Sentinel as a useful tool, as almost like a query and joining up tool for being able to remotely manage multiple customer environments. And, and the key thing being that those customer environments can have all the other interesting stuff running. Um, so it runs the Defender for IoT subscription. It runs its own version of Sentinel, of course, and anything else that maybe have an interesting security t an interesting security thread or audit trail for you to ingest into Sentinel, which you can then query remotely. And that then gives you the ability to add a lot more value rather than just managing OT devices, for example, which uh, may have been you know, sort of the traditional approach, but as those IT and OT barriers get more and more dissolved, then we're seeing this is what some of our customers are actually asking for, is a more joined up approach a more holistic view across the security environment, uh, not just OT or IoT or any other acronym we can think of ending in OT, uh, but a more joined up view across all of that space. So that was the last part. Maybe relieved to know we're a couple of minutes early. Um, any questions on the last, well, last hour and a half actually, uh, with Richard here as well? Yeah, there's, uh, there's been plenty, Paul, um, but I've answered them all for you. <laughs> so making your job a little bit easier. <laughs> so a few good ones coming in, things like, um, you know, are we mapping to the OT MITRE ATT&CK framework? 
Um, apparently there's a couple of different versions of that, so I'm going to clarify exactly which one. Um, but yes, we do have mappings to that framework and they do appear in the alerts. So you'll be able to extract those from the alerts, either directly from Azure Defender for IoT into your other solutions or via Azure Sentinel. One of the previous questions we didn't cover, Paul, and if you've got it here in your UI, under getting started, if you can show where the license files are available, that'd be, I think, a good thing to cover. So when you come into this section, you're first setting this up. I'm, oh, I'm just going to let you continue sharing the screen. I'm just going to mention it very quickly. This is where you get your uh, ISO images from, um, but it's also where you set up the sensor. So when you click on onboarding, you then get prompted to either set up a cloud connected sensor, which is uh, the option that I want to go. I'll oh, change it now to enterprise network cloud connected or operational network on premises. This changes the way the activation works. If you go to the bottom one, Sorry, that would be oh, changed. No worries. The bottom one means I want to do offline. So the sensor won't look for the internet. It'll only install offline. And that's what runs, say, on your laptop. And you don't need a you don't need to be cloud connected for that one. But the other two, enterprise network operational network, this means that I'm wanting to connect to the network and it's going to look for an internet connectivity when you try to do this. Uh, and if you don't have that internet connection, it will fail. So hopefully that answers your setup questions. And if you have any more problems setting up your lab environments, that is exactly what Paul and I are here to help you. And the name is then part of the license file, which so if we registered this, um, it would actually register as Richard's house would be the name of the sensor. So you'll get a, a license file, which you then download into the sensor we showed earlier, and that just activates it from a, from a licensing perspective. So we did two things when we bought Cyberx. We changed the uh, logo uh, and we changed the way the license file works, I think, as well. Perfect. Right, I've got one more slide actually before I forget. Um, two, actually, I lied. I always lie. Uh, where are they? All right, this is the first one, and, and I know because Richard's actually given us a, a sec for this as well. Um, now, if any of this is of interest with an IoT, Defender for IoT, there's a fantastic um, curated list of bits of things you can go and read. I'm not going to say it's a training course because it's not, but it is a lovely set of curated content you can work your way through depending on your area of interest to get an idea. If you want to go and build your own sensor, uh, there's about a 40 deck PowerPoint in there somewhere, plus a pointer to an online Word document, which uh, gives you a lot of information on how to do it, for example. So lots of good information. Uh, if you're aware that we do ninja training for quite a few of our security products, it seems to be the, uh, the in way of getting information out. I noticed Richard posted a link onto the uh, sample PCAPs, and that is a list actually for PCAPs, uh, sorry, for the docs page for IoT. And finally, the whole point of this session almost was uh, enable you to go and run a pop pilot demo, whatever you want to call it. It probably won't amaze you to know that Richard and I have measured on how many POCs our partners actually go off and do with customers. So the ability for you to go run a POC either with just by capturing PCAPs with Wireshark, by running it as a Hyper-V on your laptop and connecting the laptop to your customer's switch, whatever it might be, whatever method you can work get works for your customer base, that's what we want to help you with. So we're here to make sure that the number of POCs are actually running with, uh, with Defender for IoT. And of course, we're hoping that they'll eventually turn into sales down the line as well. But the primary role is to make sure you've got enough information and enough material, as it were, and ammunition to go off and be successful with one of these POC engagements.